Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my mystery series where today I want to cover another Jane Doe case, the Ledyard Jane Doe. In a bit of a twist, we actually do have a name for this Jane Doe, an alias of Lorraine Stahl that she went by in the days before her death. And we even know her murderer, we just don't know her actual identity. We don't know where she came from, her family still haven't been able to be notified. She is unidentified. Also, if you haven't been able to tell already, I do have quite a bad cold, so if I sound a bit like nasally or a bit croaky, that's why. I've just got to film today because I'm going on holiday next week, and if I don't film today, you won't get any videos, so we're fighting through. This story began in May 1974 when Connecticut State Police received an anonymous tip regarding two murders that apparently occurred at a residence on Shoeville Road in Ledyard. Ledyard is a town in New London County, Connecticut in the United States, obviously, located along the Thames River. I didn't know there was a Thames River in the USA, now I do. Nowadays, Ledyard has a population of just over 15,000 people, and in all honesty, it doesn't seem to have grown much since 1970, when it had a population of just under 15,000 people, so it stayed pretty consistent since when this crime was discovered. On the 30th of May 1974, this location was searched and the police found two bodies, one male and one female. Some sources say that the bodies were found in a shallow grave in a wooded area several hundred feet behind the home, whilst a couple of other newspaper articles I found from the time stated that the bodies were found in a swamp. Also, you'll see confusion online over whether the bodies were found in Ledyard or Stonington, but it actually seems they were found pretty much on the boundary line between the two places, so that's why the questions. The bodies are both fairly decomposed, with the female Jane Doe or Lorraine Stone Network page stating that her state of remains was not recognisable, a near or complete skeleton. She had also been found wrapped in a blanket, whereas as far as I could find, the male body had not been. By the beginning of July, the male body was identified via dental records as that of Gustavus Lee Carmichael, a bank robber who had escaped from authorities in 1970 when he was 24 years old, and he hadn't been seen since. Carmichael had stolen more than $1 million by committing bank robberies and was last seen on the 5th of October 1970 when him and an accomplice, Roger J. Brown, escaped whilst being transported from a Massachusetts prison to their sentencing hearing. They managed to overpower the federal agents transporting them by using their handcuffs to bind them to a tree before stealing their guns and running away, literally like something out of a movie. And they didn't exactly go into hiding after that point, or at least not straight away anyway, they did continue to rob banks for a little bit it seems after their escape. Whilst Roger Brown was eventually recaptured and sentenced to 62 years in prison for various robberies and escape incidents, Carmichael remained evasive likely because he died not long after. The female body found alongside his, though, has never been identified. According to the Doe Project, she was white between the ages of 18 to 30, some sources say 35, around 5 foot 2 with brown or auburn hair, but due to the state of decomposition, her eye colour, weight and any distinguishing marks or features are unknown. However, a newspaper article from the Lewiston Evening Journal at the time describes her as being in her 20s, about 5 foot 1 with red hair and weighing 110 to 115 pounds. There were multiple clues available at the scene in terms of her clothing, luckily. She was wearing a tan leather wet look vest, a gold or tan sweater, a brown tweed skirt, brown granny boots that reached the knee and a yellow raincoat. Overall, a fairly fashionable outfit for the time. She was also found wearing a class-like ring featuring the letters JHNS or JNHS with the initials ILN engraved on the inside. This is the item that probably gives us the biggest clues here but likely not to Jane Doe's identity as it also had the date 1917 engraved on the side. Obviously the descriptions here describe it as a class-like ring as it can't be confirmed that's exactly what it was. But for those of us who aren't entirely sure what a class ring is, I gave it a Google, and by us I mean me, I wasn't sure what it was. Taken from Wikipedia, in the United States, a class ring, also known as a graduation, graduate, senior or grad ring, is a ring worn by students and alumni to commemorate their graduation, generally for a high school, college or university. Often class rings will feature the initials of the high school or university the person attended and sometimes people also get them engraved with their own initials as well. So you can see why this would have been a pretty big clue but Jane Doe would not have been old enough to be graduating school in 1917 suggesting that it likely belonged to a parent or potentially even a grandparent. 
The JHNS or JNHS is potentially a clue as to where our Jane Doe's family went to school, although I'm sure there are plenty of schools with those initials. It's something that should be looked into and I'm sure it already has been extensively, but I'd be very intrigued to look through high school yearbooks going back that far from schools in the area or areas Jane Doe might have been from with those initials, looking for people with the initials ILN. Of course though, there is also the possibility that the ring was stolen. Police were sent to several states hoping to gather information around this to no avail, and they've also speculated that the outside initials may have indicated the ring was from a nursing school. I assume they're referring to the JHNS. So they placed stories in nursing and medical bulletins throughout the country, hoping to find the school that might have issued the ring, but none was located. It's also noted in a Daily News newspaper article at the time that Jane Doe was also wearing another ring, an inexpensive one with an animation emerald stone, as well as a wood carved brooch or pendant that appeared to be an abstract ceremonial head. The only other personal item found with the body was a Lady Clairol hair roller set, suggesting that she was somebody who liked to look after their appearance, and whoever killed her just threw her in the swamp or in this wooded area and threw her belongings out with her. Her fingerprints were not available because of the state of decomposition, and whilst her dentals technically are available, both her and Carmichael's cause of death was homicide by gunshot wounds. Carmichael died from gunshot wounds to the head and chest, whilst Jane Doe died from a gunshot wound to her head and brain. She was shot through her mouth, meaning her maxilla, her upper jaw, was destroyed. There is very limited dental records they can have with that. A composite sketch was created of Jane Doe of what she may have looked like in life and that is currently on the screen now. Missing persons files were checked but there were no matches, it didn't seem like anyone had ever reported her as missing. Although this was the 1970s and I find myself wondering how far out they checked. Obviously the data wouldn't have been computerised back then as it is now so it would have been a lot of like manual pulling of files and human error means things can get missed. Maybe there is a dusty old missing persons report out there somewhere, or maybe not. It was later determined that the pair had been murdered at some point in late 1970, which was four years before their bodies were discovered. It's unclear to me exactly how, but during their investigation, the police discovered a phone bill that reportedly belonged to the unidentified woman. Some newspaper articles say it was found with her body, some say it wasn't. I mean, this is sometimes the case with such historic cases, some information just gets lost over the years. Even the Doe Network page just refers to a New Jersey Bell telephone bill showing a list of numbers that this Jane Doe was thought to have called with very little information about where it came from. I don't know if it was found with the body or not. This telephone bill shows calls made to Nashville, Tennessee, Philadelphia, Langbourne, Bristol and Levittown in Pennsylvania, Heightstown, Riverside, Caldwell, Allentown and Burlington in New Jersey, as well as an outgoing call from Newark, Wilmington in Delaware, and ingoing calls to New York City and Buffalo in New York. It actually looks like two bills, one dated January 7th, 1971 and December 7th, 1971. The calls were made throughout November and December. The last call, at least on these bills, was made on the 17th of December, but of course there's no guarantee that Jane Doe made these calls herself and they weren't addressed to her, these bills. They were actually addressed to a CM Fox Jr. Seeing as the bills literally have the phone numbers that she called or potentially called on them, I find myself wondering if investigators ever actually called any of the numbers and spoke to the people on the other end. They probably did, but we don't have any information surrounding that. But it didn't actually take long until they did find a name for Jane Doe. They found out people around the area had known her as Lorraine Stahl. Only, of course, that was never her true identity. It was stolen. At some point shortly after Carmichael escaped, he probably met a woman, our Jane Doe. She would go on to use the name Lorraine Stahl, but she's also thought to have used the name Sandy and Connie on occasion as well. She is also thought to have been running from the law alongside Carmichael, with newspaper articles from the time suggesting that she may have worked as a sex worker in New York, although it does seem that might have just been speculation from law enforcement. We don't know exactly how Carmichael and Jane Doe met, but it seems that not long after they met, they turned up in Ledyard, which brings us to how her killer was ultimately convicted. An investigation into the murders quickly revealed that the home behind which the pair had been buried belonged to a man called Richard DeFratis. 
Defratus and two others, Donald Brandt and James Gardner, robbed banks for a living and they shared any proceeds equally. And they also ran numerous safe houses in the Connecticut area that they used to house fugitives and hide them from the law. Towards the end of 1970, Carmichael and his girlfriend Jane Doe turns up there. Defratus had a common law wife called Joanne Rainello, who said that the couple came to the home on the 28th of December 1970 looking for a place to hide out, and herself and Defratus helped them establish aliases as Dirk and Lorraine Stahl, a married couple. There actually was a real Lorraine Stahl who had lived for a few months in a motel called the Whalers Inn in Mystic, a village in Stonington, and she just so happened to live across the hall from the Defratuses at the time. The real Lorraine would later say that the Defratuses actually babysat for her children quite often, and when she eventually moved away from the area, she discovered that both her driver's license and social security card were missing. It would transpire that the Defratuses had stolen her identity to give to Jane Doe, who lived as Lorraine Stahl from then until her death. Carmichael became Lorraine's husband, Dirk, and the two were supposed to attempt to live as normal a life as possible, just living under the radar. But very, very soon the couple, Lorraine especially it seems, started to become suspicious of Richard de Freitas and his motivations. Lorraine expressed fears to Joanne Rinello about the life she was leading, and said that she was nervous about using a fake name. She was scared about being caught by the police, and didn't know what she would say if she was questioned. Rinello told Defratus this pretty soon after, so Defratus called his business partner, Donald Brandt, from Rhode Island to Ledyard to discuss this threat the woman posed for them. After discussion, Defratus and Brandt decided to kill both Carmichael and Lorraine, Jane Doe, because they had too much at stake. Lorraine posed the main threat they knew, but they couldn't kill her without Carmichael intervening and kicking up a fuss, so he had to die also as just collateral damage. After making plans, Defratus lured the victims to his home on Shoeville Road in Ledyard on December 31st, 1970, before shooting them. Carmichael first, then Lorraine. They would later describe the events to their third business partner, James Gardner, and Joanne Rainello. Gardner assisted them as they buried the bodies out back of the house, and the bodies were actually transported to this burial location by a sled. A sled that was later gifted to a local man for his children in early 1971. Defratus has denied this. He's denied being a murderer, saying that he was a robber, but he wasn't a murderer. He also denied ever having met Lorraine or Carmichael, and denied having a partnership with Gardner or Brandt, saying that he's never trusted Gardner. Regardless, a jury did find Defratus and Grant guilty of two counts of murder in the first degree, but no one was ever able to provide any answers as to who Lorraine Stoll really was. Nobody knew her name before she turned up in Ledyards. It's not even known if Carmichael knew her true identity. They can't have been together for that long, seeing as he only went on the run in October, unless they met before or whilst he was in jail. I also want to point out here that Carmichael was only 24 years old at this time, and the likelihood is that his girlfriend, Lorraine, would have been around the same age. Her estimated age range is around 18 to 35, but if I were to place bets, I would say she was towards the younger end of that spectrum, just based on their relationship. But then again, people do have relationships and bigger age gaps, so that's just generalising. People from around Ledyard did remember Carmichael and Lorraine, who told police that she had been known to drive around in a 1964 green Oldsmobile with either Massachusetts or Maine plates. The vehicle was later found dumped in Hartford, Connecticut, which is about 50 miles northwest of Ledyard, and it was found with a Maine inspection sticker. Which is interesting, as Connecticut isn't all that close to Maine. I mean, like, in regards to the whole of the USA, it is, but it's still separated by two whole states, even if they are small ones. This obviously suggests that the car had been in Maine at some point, but none of this led to any further clues as to the woman's true identity. According to newspaper articles at the time, she's apparently last known to be working in New York City, maybe as a sex worker, and is believed to have relatives living in Tennessee, West Virginia, or the Carolinas. She could well have been from New York or Maine herself, but that's about all we have. I did find one forum post online that piqued my interest, but I want it known that I can't substantiate any of this information, so please do take it with a pinch of salt. A post on treasurenet.com by a user called Redcoat says that they believe the car was ultimately traced as having been purchased in Bridgeport on the 28th of October 1970 and registered in Maine on the 15th of December to a man called David Skaggs with a fictitious address in Portland. 
This apparently was one of Carmichael's aliases. Jane Doe was later seen driving this car in the days before her death. Again, I don't know how this user has this information, no sources are linked, I couldn't find any other evidence, but there was just a post on WebSleuth stating something very similar as well. The same user writes in the same post about how the numbers on the aforementioned phone bill were traced, and the CM Fox Jr. on the bill is believed to have been Charlie Fox, a man who ran bowling alleys and music venues in around Trenton, New Jersey. One of his music venues was the Frontier Rooms, which was apparently known for hostesses and dancing girls, which are euphemisms for sex workers. Tracing all of this is probably why police at the time speculated that Lorraine might have been a sex worker. If this is true and Lorraine danced at the venue, she'd probably use another alias there, so even then nobody would have known her true identity. As I said, I can't substantiate any of this, but it does all seem to make sense to what investigators have actually confirmed, so I'm inclined to believe this information. Jane Doe's dental records and DNA are available for comparison, and anyone with information regarding her identity are asked to contact Connecticut's Chief Medical Examiner's Office, which I'll leave the number for down below. If I'm being completely honest, it doesn't seem like investigators at the time went particularly out of their way to find Jane Doe's true identity. She was likely just brushed off as a criminal or a sex worker and not worthy of identifying. At this point, the most likely way we're going to get her identified is via DNA and genealogy tracing. As far as I can find, the DNA Doe project are not working on her case and there's no way for members of the public to request cases on their website. Only law enforcement can do that. I don't know how you'd go about contacting the Connecticut State Police to ask them to put in a request for this case with DNA Doe Project, but if anyone has any connections or maybe knows anyone on their cold case team, perhaps it could be worth an ask. I know that's a long shot, but I'm just going to put it out there. All in all, it seems like Lorraine's case is one that's been pretty brushed under the carpet. I couldn't really find any other podcasts or YouTube videos about her case. But just like all other Doe, she deserves an identity, she deserves her name. There's probably a family out there somewhere wondering what happened to their daughter, sister, niece, someone who disappeared around late 1970 or before. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. I'm so sorry about the cold. Hopefully that hasn't put you off. Fingers crossed I'll be recovered by next week, so all will be good. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.